Well, here we are on a Wednesday night once again, and it's time to get underway. And I looked at the clock that said 6.30. I said, uh-oh, time to start, and I was enjoying fellowship, so I interrupted myself this time. But uh, anyway, it's good to see you. For those of you watching online, thank you for joining us. And uh, in case you're wondering, okay, there were a bunch of younger couples in here earlier. Uh, and where are they? Did they just eat and leave? No. Uh, they've got some sort of little study going on, and I'm not sure. I'd tell you what it was if I knew. But they got some sort of study going on this, this week or this, this time. And uh, so they're, they're all gathered up over in what we call the mouse trap, which is the third floor over there on the Second Street building. Uh, if you ever go up there, you'll understand why we call it that, because once you get up there, you can't get out of there hardly. There's so many crooks and nooks and crannies and turns and twists. Uh, if you go up there, you better take a lunch with you. <laughs> anyway, okay. A uh, couple of announcements to share with you before we get underway here and look at our prayer list. And right now, I guess it kind of sounds selfish, but they both involve legacy builders. And uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock here in this room, uh, we will have our final session uh, in the book of John, our study in there. We've been there all summer, and we're finishing it up, and we'll be dealing with the trial, or rather the arrest, the trial, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And if you want to read tonight and catch up on where we're going to be and what we're going to be talking about, you can go read John chapter 18 through the end of the uh the end of the book, <coughs> which is chapter 21, so that's as far as you'll have to go. Actually, you could stop with chapter 20, probably, uh, but read 21 anyway, because it's a great story in there about Peter's restoration, and that's well worth your time. Also, I would remind uh, our legacy builders that this is the season we're signing up for uh, Elijah Project uh, with our students. Uh, we've got some students signed up, but uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, legacy builders signed up yet. So uh, need you to give that consideration. And if you want to be a part of it, if you'll just give us a call at the office, sign us up, we'll pair you up with a, a student. And uh, they'll appreciate that, and you'll enjoy it, and it'll be a blessing for both. All right, anything else I need to announce? PK, do I need to announce anything else? I don't know of anything. All righty. Take your prayer sheet, if you will, and we'll go through it. Uh, got some information to share with you about certain folks on here that we know about, updates that we can give to you. And uh, we began, Gene Cravey is in the... Uh, Blakely County Hospital visited with Gene yesterday. Uh, he's just getting some stuff to help build up some strength and deal with some other issues. Marianne Dykes uh, was supposed to have had a procedure on Monday. They didn't do it. They moved it to Tuesday. They didn't do it. They're supposed to do it today, and I don't know if they did or not. Does anybody know? I haven't seen any of those folks to find out. Nobody's let us know anything. So. Do not know if Mary Ann had that procedure or not. Uh, upcoming procedures, Sonia Curtis uh, got surgery up, uh, coming up. Terry Lassiter, and I'm just going to highlight him for you. Terry's got some very serious heart blockages. He's got uh, one blockage that's 100%, one that's 90%, and uh, they're going to try to uh, get those things unclogged on the 28th. Um, Without going into a lot of detail, just pray for Terry. Terry's got, Terry's got a real real burden there. He said, if I don't get this done, I'm going to die. Uh, and if I just sit here, I'm going to die. So, uh, you know, just pray for him. And Pebbles is having her surgery at the end of the month. And then, of course, you see the other names that are listed there, people that we are aware of who have hurts and needs of one kind or another. And uh, over on the middle column, at the very tippy top, 
you see Butch and Martha Ann. Now, you're familiar with the fact that Butch is waiting to hear from um, a doctor when they're going to uh, schedule an appointment for him to begin some treatments. You know, Martha Ann has had some problem with her eyes and two procedures there. Butch went to the doctor today and he's got shingles. And uh, I said, you know, I, I, I don't know what they've done wrong. <laughs> but anyway, do, do remember them in your prayers. Uh, as he deals, I've never had shingles, and quite frankly, I, having watched people who've had it, I don't think I want it. If you've ever had it, you understand that. Uh, so do pray for pray for them. Uh, let's see. Shirley Wright is doing fairly well, still recovering. Uh, saw her at Walmart uh, Monday, and let's see. I guess that's all I got updates on that column. And over under life changes, and I'll mention her here, but also mention uh, Martha down at the bottom. Uh, Jan Dollar's mother, Martha Churchill. Uh, it looks like time is drawing nigh uh, for her. So uh, pray for Jan and for Danny, uh, for that entire family uh, as they... Uh, sit by mama's side uh, and it's just a it's just waiting uh, is all they're doing right now so pray for them okay uh, continue to pray for Becky uh, Holland and uh, her mother uh, they had visitation out at their house uh, Sunday afternoon Jen and I went out there saw Jessica Crumbless although she's not a Crumbless anymore saw a little not little Jessica, she's grown, and uh, saw her out there. The first time we'd seen her in uh, quite some time, so it was good to see her. Any updates that you have about any of our folks on this upper, upper list here? Okay, let's move down to our extended family, and you see the names of those there that, uh, that we are aware of. I would mention uh, David Stewart. Uh, last week, and I don't know how all of this got so convoluted, but it did, uh, we had him at Navison, and I had a text uh, on which uh, someone had said, we're on our way to Navison, and somebody else had a text that says, we're going to Piedmont. So therefore, while we didn't know where he was, and uh, so we do know this now. This is, this is gospel truth here. Uh, he is in... Piedmont, which used to be the Coliseum, and uh, he is still in ICU. They were hoping to move him out today. Uh, that did not happen, and uh, they're hoping now they'll be able to move him out tomorrow. So uh, continue to pray for Donna <coughs> and for uh, David Stewart. Also, Mr. Wallace Butts, that's, uh, that's Johnny's daddy. We'll be having knee surgery on the 30th. Pray for that family. And then, of course, we did mention Miss Martha Churchwell. She's down there at the bottom of our list. Uh, continue to pray for her uh, and her home going, just that God would be merciful. And I don't think I have any other updates except for one. Over on the right-hand side, uh, last column, about uh, just a little bit past halfway down, Gary Thornson, uh, that's PK's stepfather, and uh, dealing with some pretty serious health issues. But heard some good news about what the Track Rock folks did for those folks. Uh, they went there to get their camper buttoned up, buckled up, uh, and put back in storage. And when they got there, it was pretty much all done. So kudos to you guys and the others that pitched in and helped with that. But that doesn't surprise me. I mean, that's the way FBC folks are. So we're grateful for that. All righty. I think that is the only update I had. Do you have any update? Oh, I would mention one other. I'm sorry. Uh, up at the top of that right-hand column, Charlie Mullis, that's Rosie's husband. I did talk with Rosie yesterday. And uh, Charlie's about the same. Uh, hospice, of course, you know about them being involved. And so continue to pray for Rosie. It's been a, it's 
been a long, long journey for her with her son and now with her husband. So uh, you can imagine she's just frazzled uh, physically and emotionally and everything else. So pr pray for Rosie uh, and pray for Charlie as well. And I think that is all the updates I'm going to have for tonight. How about you? Do you have some? Teresa Dykes. Oh, I was looking in the other place. Okay. How about your, uh, let's see, didn't, don't you have a nephew that's on this list somewhere? Okay. All right. And Keith Martin. Okay. That's good. Danielle, you got those, I'm sure. Any other up? Yes. Yeah. Glad things are going, going well, all things considered. Any other updates on our extended family? All right, go to the back side, and of course we've got our folks in our care facilities. We were out at uh, Royal Care yesterday, had a worship time with them. Uh, Leanna played, and uh, Bonnie Sapp led the singing. And we had, I think there were six of the ladies out there uh, able to be with us. Uh, others uh, just not doing well and uh, were not able to get out of their rooms and come. So it's kind of a kind of a sad, sad situation with those folks. Uh, so pray for them. Pray, pray for Betty Harvey. She's the uh, head honcho out there. I don't know what her official title, administrator or director or boss or whatever. But anyway, pray for her because she's got quite a quite a load there. Also, then we see our special prayer needs. Uh, continue to pray for them. Pray for our Little Light Preschool. It's going well. Uh, Millie is doing a great job with that, as we knew that she would. And uh, we appreciate uh, all that she and Donna are doing. Pray for those folks in Hawaii. If you've seen the news and the devastation that's there, uh, it's hard to comprehend. And seeing it on television is one thing, but seeing it in person would be another. I remember back in, when we had the flood back in, was that 93, 94? And uh, I went down with some others to work down uh, along Kichapuni Creek uh, outside of Albany there in Lee County, uh, which had been devastated by the floodwaters as well. But just driving through some of those neighborhoods and seeing all of the devastation and all of the, the belongings of the houses that were brought out there and piled up beside the road. And just, when you see it on TV, it's one thing. But when you see it in person, it's another. So pray for those folks in Hawaii. Uh, yes. It's a uh, designated organization <coughs> to receive contributions for help, like Samaritan's Purse and we designate for the victims. I can't say definitely because I, I, I don't have that information, but I would imagine knowing Samaritan's Purse the way I do, uh, they, if you sent something to them designated Hawaii, uh, it would get there. Um, I'm not sure disaster relief, I'm sure there will be some involvement by Southern Baptists through our disaster relief, but I have not yet seen or heard anything about that. If you send it to Georgia Baptist Convention for disaster relief marked Hawaii, they would see that it gets to where it needs to go uh, if they even just send it over to the Hawaii uh, Baptist Convention. So you could do it that way. Pray for our missionaries. Uh, I thought we had a very, very fine missionary with us last Sunday. He did an excellent job. And by the way, if you're interested in some materials, he left some there on the table just before you go in the sanctuary. 
And then, of course, we have that list of expectant parents, and uh, uh, Faye's already given us a report on uh, Seth and Elizabeth, and we're grateful for that. And then there are others that uh, are continuing to need prayers, and so uh, remember them as well. Anything or anybody we need to pray for? Probably could pray for some relief from this heat. Y'all seen what the weather for Saturday is going to be? It's going to be beautiful? Uh huh. It may be going to be beautiful, but it's going to be a hot beautiful. 102? But I know. 98, 102. Can you tell the difference? Nah. That's okay. Winter is coming. 128 days to Christmas. All righty. If there are no other additions to our, uh, our prayer list, uh, we'll take some time to go to the Lord in prayer. I would ask that you pray uh, where you are, and uh, I'll lead us in our time of prayer. And then Pastor Keith is going to come and share with us from God's Word. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the privilege of being able to come into your presence and bring to you the concerns of our heart, the desires of our heart concerning uh, these of our church family and of our community. So many hurts, so many needs. I just pray, God, you'll minister as only you can there. That you would affect healing, Father, where healing is needed according to your will. For those, Father, who are struggling with life issues, I pray that you'll give them wisdom, guidance, discernment, courage, strength, boldness, all of the things that they need as they cope with those issues. Father, I pray for those who are dealing with uh, death in their families, uh, and I just pray, God, you'll minister to them. Give them your peace. Give them your comfort through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, for our expectant parents. Uh, what a joyful time it is for them in the anticipation of the arrival of a, a newborn. And we just pray, God, that uh, these pregnancies will go well, especially tonight we remember Elizabeth and Seth uh, as uh, they've had some issues with uh, uh, things in, in their final weeks here. So I just pray, God, that you'll take charge of that situation as well as these other parents-to-be. And I just pray, God, you'll... Uh, You'll do what only you can do. Lord, we thank you for our missionaries, for the one who spoke with us on Sunday, did such a great job. Thank you for sending him our way. And thank you for the work that he has been involved in. For our other missionaries, Father, that uh, are on foreign fields here in these United States and in other places, Lord, we just pray or for them uh, as they continue to do your work. And, uh, God, may we always continue to pray for them and support them uh, through our gifts, uh, through the cooperative program. Uh, just thank you, God, for the privilege of holding the rope. Thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. I pray you'll bless uh, Pastor Keith as he comes now uh, to share with us from your word. And, Father, give us ears to hear and eyes to see those things we need to see and hear. All of this we pray in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, there we go. So this week, we're going to really kind of finish up what we started last week, which is uh, more of a practical uh, teaching moment. Um, <clears throat> you know, we looked at last week, biblically speaking, we looked at um, the importance of recognizing that um, anything that we uh, in our lives support, connect ourselves to, attend, join in, whatever it is, uh, we need to realize that that's going to that's gonna say something about us to the people around us. And, and I use the example of a 
Did you give me a, a hand signal? I did. I needed permission to speak again. <laughs> permission granted. Next Wednesday night, 630. <laughs> right yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just as I stepped away, I got this from Jeff. And Lynn, I think you just got it too. Uh, but it's the address uh, for disaster relief for Hawaii. Uh, there is a website you can go to. It's called Disaster Relief Hawaii Pacific Baptist Association. And that will give you information on how you can give support uh, to the folks there in Hawaii. And I have a feeling that in the next seconds or minutes, all of that information is going to pop up on that screen right there. It probably will. Because he probably right now is typing it in. It'll be up there. So if you're like, I didn't get all that, what the? Hang on a second. And even if he hadn't thought about doing that, he just now did <laughs> when I put him on the spot. So uh, so we talked about, you know, how, uh, for instance, I used the example last week. You, If you're looking over somebody's resume and everything looks good about this person, you know, and, and their education and their this, that, and other, and, and um and you're looking at it, and it gets down there to, you know, organizations that I'm a part of, and you read, you know, maybe they're part of Rotary International, or maybe they're part of Kiwanis, and then if you read that they're an active member in the KKK, you're going to stop. And you say, okay, wait a second. Uh, now, now I have some questions about this person. Why? Because of what we know that that organization stands for. We've got to, we, we got to be wise about who and where we associate. My grandmother uh, had four or five favorite warnings or pieces of wisdom or pithy sayings or whatever you want to say, but four or five things that she just constantly uh, drilled me on. I mean, every chance she got, she would say them. And one of them, she'd say, grandson, you know that we're supposed to avoid all appearances of evil. You know what? My grandmother's right. As Christians, we've been called to walk in the light. And so we want to, you know, we want to, uh, we want to walk in, in, in all places. Not that everything we're associated with has to be, you know, a, a church-based or a spiritual-based or religious-based thing, but we also have to think about, okay, why? There have been times before uh, when I've known of people like, for instance, that will buy, buy a T-shirt, and it'll have an emblem on it or a logo or whatever that is representative of something that they have no idea is representative of. They just thought it was a cool-looking shirt, and they're walking around. And then you say, okay, do, are you aware of what that, that T-shirt is, is promoting there? Do, do you know, you know? And they're like, hmm, no. Well, what is it? Well, it's, then you throw it out there, and they're like, oh, my gosh, are you serious? And I said, yeah. I don't, I don't do that. And I said, well, the people that see you aren't going to know that because they're going to, you see, what we associate. So we need to know. We need to know who we are and where we're from and what we're associated with in all of our lives. And we want to, we do want to avoid uh, the appearance uh, of evil. Uh, that does not mean we refrain from the world. That doesn't mean we step out there into the real world of uh, darkness and sin. But we do it in a godly way, in a righteous way, in a smart way, in a wise way. Jesus is talking to his uh, disciples as he got ready to send them out. You know, he's talking about, I'm sending you out as, what, sheep among Wolves, but he says, so you need to, you got to learn, you got to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, you know, as you, as you go out there. And so I said all that, this was all last week, for those of you who may weren't here, if you weren't here, if you're online tonight. And, and the one thing that I really focused down on was the fact that um, <clears throat> if you're a part of this church, then that means you are associated with the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, which is our state convention. And our state convention is associated with the Southern Baptist Convention. And I, and I just, I want you to know that among those who have n no idea <clears throat> about who, who and what Baptists are, there are a lot of people that have not a good opinion of Baptists in general. And a lot of it's because they just don't know who we are. And there's even some that may be in, 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 in our church, sitting in the pews or sitting in here right now, that, that don't know an awful lot about Southern Baptist and, and who we are. And it's not some great big, you know, majestic thing. But I think it's important so that if you're out there talking to people and they say, hey, where do you go to church? And you say, I go to First Baptist Church. And they'll say, Ugh, a Baptist church. I don't like Baptists. Well, you need to be able to say, well, why not? What, what don't you like about Baptists? 
You remember last week I told you the story about visiting with the woman, me and my deacon chairman up in North Carolina? And um, she had really enjoyed our church, but she, she, there was one question she wanted to ask about our church before she would come back. Who remembers what that question was? Snakes. Do you all handle snakes in that church? <laughs> I, I mean, she associated that with Baptist churches. Now, I've never been to a snake handling church. Has anybody ever been to a snake handling church? Yeah. <laughs> Lynn, you have? Uh-huh. And um, down in Florida. And there was a little girl in the Bible school, Bible school, and we did not speak. And the, she did not because her mother had been holding her when a snake came into their yard. And the mother, being a snake handler, picked up the snake. The snake handler got bit and died? Yes. And That's not the way it's supposed to work, is it? No. Okay. Wow. But that's what happened. Yeah. See, I think snake handling, I, don't know, I shouldn't even mention that. But, you know, snake handling is really a misappropriation of Scripture, scriptural teaching. And um, <clears throat> that's why we only do it once a year here because I don't think it's something that you should, you know, do on a regular basis. So, so. Uh, we kind of started looking at it last week. I asked each table. We shared some things, if I, and I asked you what were some distinctives, and there are two or three things that really stood out that I thought were really good. Uh, in, 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 in addition to any and everything else that we are, and we have this really long history, the Southern Baptist Convention is historically a, uh, a Bible-believing group of believers. We believe God's Bible. We believe it's truth. Even if we don't understand that truth, we still believe it's truth. Uh, uh, Baptists believe that it is not for us to shape the Bible to fit us. Our calling is to allow the Holy Spirit to shape our lives so that it reflects the truth of Scripture. Um, we're conservative in our doctrine across the board. There are many current cultural things that the Southern Baptist Convention uh, stands in opposition to. Not in opposition to or hateful towards the people involved, but in opposition to the ideas that are being put out there in culture right now, whether it has to do with transgenderism or um, um, uh, gay marriage, uh, sanctity of life versus um, you know pro-choice. We're very clear on some of these stances that we take, and uh, and I think we need to be a voice, not just on the street and in the clinics and in our churches who pray, but also we have, because of what we're going to look at in a minute, we have a voice up in our uh, capital up in Atlanta and then up in Washington, D.C., because the truth is, we live in a country governed by laws. And so, you know, we want to have a voice, and Southern Baptists uh, have a voice, uh, not nearly as big a voice as uh, a lot of the, the big corporations out there, but we have a voice that speaks for the truth of Scripture. And um, so there's a lot of going on. I just shared my password with somebody. You're welcome. And um, so uh, really what I want to do tonight is just kind of finish up. I'm, I'm going to start out. <clears throat> I'm going to start out by just asking a couple of questions just to see, see what, what our knowledge is. Because, look, the, the Southern Baptist Convention has been around a long time, okay? Georgia Baptist Convention has been around a long time. The farther we get away from when something started, the less we know about it, right? Who in here has done any of the ancestry or um, the, the, the tracing down your way, way back relatives. Anybody in here done that? What's the one that's really popular? Ancestry.com and one, two, is it one, two? Huh? 23 and me. Um, uh, my boys, one of my boys, I don't know which one of y'all it was, did something, maybe Benjamin, Joshua, did something with 23 and me, I think, and then, and then located a, a cousin up, up in, uh, in the Atlanta area that we had never met before. And um, it was a, it was, it's a long story. It was a, a child that was given up for adoption at, at birth and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and they connected, they connected with him. And uh, up until they moved up to Freeport, Maine, uh, he, he was coming to uh, our Christmas celebrations. And, and, you know, it's just, it's amazing. But the, the farther we get away from something, the, the less we know. 
especially if we're not passing it from generation to generation. Okay, and that, that's a really important part is that those of us who are older help to inform those who are coming behind us, this is who we are and this is what we're about and these are our faults and these are our strengths and all these good kind of things. I found out, for instance, uh, later in life that uh, in my family, on the Rustin side of my family, my great, I mean, my grandfather, okay, O.O. O. Rustin, that's what everybody called him, O.O., o. Um, that my son back there, Jacob, is named after O.O. O. Rustin. And um, there was a time in his life when he owned about 2,500 acres, prime acres, down on the Ottomaha River. Big timber. Hunting and fishing. Great days. Beautiful down there. Then the uh, days of prohibition, my granddaddy O.O. needed to make some money. Um, those were tough times. And so, a, a, um, he was approached with, hey, well, you want to be a runner? You know, you come pick up a load of our uh, brew, and then you, you know, get it in the hands of people willing to pay money. And he said, sure, I can do that. And so he did that for a while. And then one day he noticed as he was flying through the back roads there of Long County and Tattnall County, a revenuer behind him. And that revenuer followed him all the way up to the parking, the, the driveway of the house. My daddy, a little boy, was in the house when this happened. And so basically he was facing prison because his boot was full <laughs> of unsold product. And... Um, so there was some back and forth and back and forth. And so it was either prison or he had to pay this crazy monetary fine, crazy amount. I can't, I can't, I'd have to go back and look at my records. I mean, it was a crazy amount, especially in a time of such scarcity. And so the only thing he could do to avoid going to prison was to sell that 2,500 acres of land. And he sold it, I believe I'm right on this, but he ended up selling to, to a bit of a crooked man who also happened to be the sheriff of Long County at the time, Ludowicy, Georgia. And he sold it for, had to, the, the offer that the sheriff made, and it was just enough to, to pay the fine. He paid him 10 cents on the dollar for that 2,500 acres of land. And I found all this out after I was already grown, and I'm still mad at my great-granddaddy. Because that land will be in my family right now. <laughs> what really got me on this thing was when I found out that, that the current owner had signed a $38 million contract with Georgia Pacific to come in there and harvest and replant about 1,000 acres of that land over a period of 25 years. And I called Georgia Pacific. And I said, I think I should get a percentage of that <laughs> because that was almost mine. And you know what? They didn't agree with me. So I tell you, that's a story way back then, okay? But it helps, it helps me to know that. To, it, it just fleshes out who I am. So sometimes we have to look back and be reminded. Sometimes we have to look forward. So here we go. We're going to throw some stuff out. Just out of curiosity, okay? Uh, no great things here. Uh, how many of the 50 United States, how many states have at least one Southern Baptist Affiliated church. What would you say? Somebody just jump in there and throw a number out. Nope. No 50, no 49, no counting down until I say, oh, there, there we are. Nope. Nope. What would you say? Who said? 35. Nope. Did you, did you shoot under 72 like I asked you to yesterday morning? No, I did not. <laughs> okay, can you go ahead and just, you're free to go. <laughs> it was the heat. It was the heat. The ball didn't carry as good. 41. There are 41 states that have uh, state affiliation with the Georgia uh, Southern Baptist Convention, which means there are churches in those states. And that's pretty cool because generally speaking, there were only nine states originally in the formation of the Southern Baptist Convention. And guess where all nine of those states were located? Up in the northeast, right? Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut. No, right here. We were one of the original nine. 
the, 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 the Georgia Baptist State Convention, we were one of the original nine that came together to form the Southern Baptist Convention, and that was in the year... Almost. 1845. 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention came together. Churches from nine state conventions, state affiliations, Georgia Baptist being one of the original nine, and we came together and we seceded from the North Northern Baptist Convention, which was also a part of the, I don't know, the Triennial Convention. All right? And we pulled out and we left both of those groups of Baptist churches, the Northern Baptist and the Triennial Convention, to form the Southern Baptist Convention basically for one issue. And that issue was what? Slavery. The fine Christians of the southern states felt like it was a blessing from God. That's a straight quote. And other states did not. And so we decided to form our own where we could feel good about owning slaves. Um, and so that's at the root of how we got started. The Triennial, Triennial Convention, by the way, and it was called that because it met every three years, and it was, it was actually a collection of Baptist churches from several of the various Baptist denominations like Northern Baptist. Um, but the Triennial Convention, it was actually the first national Baptist denomination in the United States. And the reason I'm looking here because I want to tell you what the official name of the Triennial Convention was. Okay, you ready for this? It was officially named the General Missionary Convention of the Baptist Denomination in the United States of America for Foreign Missions. I would have left that convention too just because I didn't want to have to memorize all that. Southern Baptist Convention is a lot easier to memorize. Uh, that, the train was actually formed in 1814 to advance missionary work, and it was headquartered in Philadelphia. So, in what Georgia city, Georgia was big in the formation of the Southern Baptist Convention because the very first meeting, charter meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention was held right here in the great state of Georgia. Who knows what city? Nope, not Savannah. Not Milledgeville. Not Macon. Not Atlanta. Huh? Augusta, Georgia. Right there, and the Southern Baptist Convention was born, 1845. But you know, that's not who we are today. It was in 1995 a resolution was presented at the Southern Baptist Convention meeting whereby, you know, for years and years we've known this, but we not, didn't want to talk about it. It's hard to be honest about something like that. It's hard to be honest and say, you know what, our convention actually has its roots in wanting to support and continue slavery, the owning of another human. And we kind of, hopefully, all of us in this room, we kind of look at that today and we think, how, how could we have been so far off? Uh, I'm really proud of our convention, if I can put it that way. In 1995, at our national meeting, a resolution was brought. And in that resolution, I started to run it off and read it to you tonight, but you, you can find it online. It was the first time in an official way that our Southern Baptist Convention, which I'm a part of and you're a part of by virtue of being a part of this church, stood up and, number one, owned it. I said, this, is, this was a part of our beginning. This was us. And we were wrong. And we not only repent of that, we make ourselves accountable to that, and we ask the forgiveness of, of the descendants of those men and women uh, who were slaves in our, in, our, in our towns, our churches, and of our pastors. I mean, it's, it's just really, it's just really, and I'll tell you what, I don't know how many of you remember, that picked up all kind of news coverage. Now, luckily, or oh, I say luckily, it wasn't like it is now. It didn't explode because of the Internet, but, I mean, it made national news that the Southern Baptist Convention was owning its past. Sometimes that's a hard thing to do. But it's important that we do that. And um, we have been, over the years, even before 1995, we've been very active as a convention and reaching across the aisle to our fellow 
African American um, Baptist churches and and even establishing Southern Baptist churches. And in 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 uh, 2012, in 2012, the first African American was elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Fred Luter. Do you know Fred? Pastor Bigel Church down there in New Orleans. And that was just that was a big deal, and he was the best man for the job. He he was he, he was the best one to go. Now that had anything to do with him being black. It had to do with the fact that man, he was doing some good ministry, and God was using him. And he was called. And so there have been so many things over the years, whereby we've 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 shown by our actions, we've shown by our actions, that we have moved way way beyond 1845 in terms of those things which moved us to to come together, and we have. We have, by the work of God, sh- sh- been shaped into an incredible Great Commission convention that supports so many across-the-board ministries to so many different kinds of people. But I still today run into I, A lot of times it's with college kids because college kids can get on the Internet, they can Google something, they can find out something in about five minutes but not get the whole picture. And, and, and man, I have a conversation with somebody that's never even been inside a Baptist church. Let us know anything about who Baptists are today. And they say, how can you go to a church that's associated with a convention that came about because you wanted to continue slavery? And I say, well, a lot of it's got to do with the fact that we believe in grace and redemption and second chances. And that's not who we are anymore. And um, so um, a couple of things um, that in 95 was a big deal. There's also been something in the news pretty much since 2018. I'm just going to read this to you because it's easier than really detailing it. But basically, um, an, an investigation had been underway. And it show, in 2018, it was released. And it showed that the Southern Baptist Convention had suppressed reports of sexual abuse and had protected over 700 accused ministers and church workers. That was a sad day when that came out. broke my heart. broke my heart. Um, and we've taken a lot, we've taken a lot of, and, and have earned it, um, taking a lot of shots in, 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 in media and culture, uh, by this fact. Uh, in 2022, uh, another report indicated church leaders had stonewalled and disparaged clergy sex abuse survivors, uh, for nearly two decades. Reform efforts have been met with criticism or dismissal from other organizational leaders. Known abusers had been allowed to keep their positions without informing their local churches. And so it was this past August, a year ago, August 12th, that uh, our Southern Baptist Convention had uh, announced that we were under federal investigation uh, related to all that. That's a dark day. Okay, it's a dark day. And we should, you should grieve, even though it wasn't the Southern Baptist Convention. When you hear of, of if you heard of the, um, you know, um, a Pentecostal denomination or Methodist denomination or, or Catholics, when you hear of ministers and, 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 and ministry workers who have abused uh, children or, or, or people, adults in their congregation, it should break our heart. And that goes on, but it does. It does. And, um, and so you may run into out there, people say, how can you be associated with a convention that has done this? And you say, well, I hate it, and my heart's broken, but we're, we're trying to work our way through and, and trying to learn from it. I've looked around to see if there was a perfect denomination anywhere. I hadn't found it yet. Now, they wouldn't let me join because I would guess that a perfect denomination requires perfection on the part of those who associate with it. But I am encouraged that our, our, our denomination, our Southern Baptist Convention and the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, our state convention, there seems to be a real effort to be transparent and to own it. Just like I preach about what we have to do in our own lives. We've got to own it. And that's the only way you begin to heal from it. You own it, you seek forgiveness, and then you move forward. Um, so that's kind of a big picture of some of the things that, you know, we're, we're, that are part of uh, good and bad at the Southern Baptist Convention. But I, want, I really want to spend the last few minutes really talking about the good because there's so much. 
just by virtue of the fact that you're a part of this church and we give through this church to the cooperative program, okay? And uh, 55% of every dollar we send up to Georgia um, stays in Georgia and the other 45% goes to the Southern Baptist or the National Convention. And it's a cooperative effort of all the churches. That's, that's, that's one of the big things about our convention. Cooperation is built into almost everything we do because somebody figured out, Lottie Moon helped us on this, we have all figured out that if we pool our resources, we can do a lot more than if we all try to act independently. Um, now, just th this kind of stuff that's going to put you to sleep, or could put you to sleep, that's what I'm only going to take about a minute on it. In Georgia, the state of Georgia, uh, gifts are giving, as a whole state, as an entire state, are giving to the cooperative program in Georgia has declined from a high of $49.5 million in 2007 to $35.8 million in 2021, which is a drop in giving of about $13.7 million from 2007 to 2021. So when our, when our cooperative giving begins to fall back, well, then we have to start cutting ministries. We have to start redoing, you know, and uh, because it's all, it's all faith-based and it's all willful giving. They don't, um, you know, the Georgia Baptist office and the Southern Baptist office, they don't call me up and say, okay, y'all's dues this year are this much and this much. They just invite us to give, to give together through the cooperative program. We give through our budget, 20%. Of every dollar that you give to this church goes to the cooperative program, goes through the cooperative program to the state and then on to the Southern Baptist Convention. But on the flip side of that, um, Southern Baptists uh, gave more than $200 million through the cooperative program. That's all Southern Baptist churches gave more, over $200 million through the cooperative program in fiscal year 21-22. That's the first time that's happened since 2008. So while in Georgia, for whatever reason, our giving has kind of been, you know, dropping for several years in a row, nationally it seems to be picking up. So let me throw this out at you. $200 million sounds like a lot of money. Does that sound like a lot of money to y'all? Some of y'all might be pocket change, but to me, I can't even imagine $200 million. And like, wow, our churches cooperatively, willingly have given $200 million towards the causes and the ministry of the Southern Baptist Convention? Yeah. But to give you a little perspective, if I can do this real quick, there are in the Southern Baptist Convention 47,198 churches. So that means that the giving level is at $4,237 per church to get to that $200 million. Our giving is, uh, is amazing, but it's, it's not overwhelming. It's amazing. There are churches like this one that give way, way more. And then there are some churches that give as little as they can give and still consider themselves Southern Baptists. But in terms of cooperative giving, it's always been about Equal sacrifice. Not, not equal amounts, but equal sacrifice. Um, so, let me ask this. Who's ever, I think it happens at Walmart a lot. I don't know if it's every time. Does anybody ever go through the self-checkout? Anybody in here go through self-checkout? Have you ever seen when you're checking out and right before you get ready to do whatever it says, would you like to donate to whatever? I don't even pause. I just hit, no, thank you, and move on. Why? Because I give through this church to the cooperative program. The cooperative program enables Baptists in our state and around our nation and around our world to be involved in any kind of ministry you can think of, whether it's feeding the hungry, whether it's clothing the naked, whether it's putting chaplains in prison. When you give faithfully through your church, through a Southern Baptist church, you are supporting all these kind of ministries. And there's some really good ones that, 
that are not Southern Baptist associated, like um, um, Habitat for Humanity. That's a great ministry. That's great. We don't. That's not supported. That's not a Southern Baptist ministry. Uh, Franklin Graham's organization. That's a good one. But it's not supported. But almost any area of ministry, whether it's um, human trafficking, whether it's preventing child abuse, hunger, mobile clinics, whatever it is. When you give through a Southern Baptist church, especially this one, which is such a generous church in what we do with our giving, 33% of every dollar, and y'all need to know this, and you need to pass this along, 33 cents out of every dollar that comes into this church goes right back out either to the cooperative program or to area and local ministries such as Willing Hands and Promise of Hope Men's Recovery and um, Sacred Roots Farm and, and all these kind of things. One of the most generous churches I've ever had the privilege and honor to pastor in my 42 years of pastoring. And I, I believe with all that's within me that one of the reasons for God's financial blessing on this church is your willingness to be generous and to give. Generosity always moves you into the waterfall of God's blessing. So let me close it out this way, all right? Number one, I want to throw that out there. If you understand who we are at Southern Baptist, you never, you never need to feel guilty again. If somebody says, would you like to donate to help feed the hungry? You never have to feel guilty about saying, no, not today. And there have been a couple times when I've had people kind of challenge me on that. And they'll say, oh, come on. I can't believe you don't want to help feed the hungry. I said, no, I do. And I do that through my church giving. And then I just walk off. I don't say it in a mean way. I just, you know, I just say, talk to the hand. And I walk on off. I want you to listen to this. I'm just going to put these out of these in a hurry. Because of the cooperative program, which is really at the heart of how we do life in the Southern Baptist, Georgia Baptist Convention, we are a great commission-focused group of people. Missions has always been right dead center of what we do and how we do, both here in North America and around the world. But because of your faithfulness and giving, because you're a part of this church, I'm just going to read these. Georgia Baptist Ministries are able to fund and support and engage in the mobile health ministry. Well, we have these mobile things. We're talking in the deacons. Do I have another deacon in here? Active deacon? Yeah, we've been talking about, Clay, Clay has been talking about the, the uh, dental, uh, the, the mobile dental clinics. We're going to be having it come to Bluffton County. These are things that our, our Georgia Baptists are able to do and put together and we, are, or we can be a part of. Mobile health ministry, collegiate ministry, evangelism, ministry wives, next generation kids, public affairs and advocacy, chaplaincy, disaster relief, strengthening Spanish ministries in our sister churches, missions, church planning, discipleship, literacy, missions, discipleship, next gen students, pastor wellness, women, worship and music. We're able to support Bruton Parker College, one of our Baptist institutions. We're able to support Shorter University, one of our Baptist institutions. Truett McConnell University, one of our Baptist institutions. And for many, many years, the flagship Baptist college and university was a little school just up the road called Mercer University. And then Mercer kind of started going in a direction that was a bit contrary to uh, what we believe is Baptist and that relationship came to an end. We're able to be a part of and, and be active in and give to um, our Baptist children's homes. There are two. Is that right? ABC. Huh? There's three Baptist children's homes. We have our Baptist Village Retirement Centers. And the ABC Clinic is not associated directly with Southern Baptists, but we do support it. But we do support it. He, uh, us as a church. There are 3,400 3, other Southern Baptist churches just in the state of Georgia. Now, under every one of those things I just called out, that's like the umbrella. And then under each one of those are incredible ministries that we make available to, to people in our state. For instance, I'm just going to pick next-gen students, which is middle school, high school stuff. Because of our giving and other 3,400 churches giving in our state, we have the Super Wow Conference. We're able to offer the Impact Conference, the Move Conference, and we have summer-long camps at both Camp Kaleo 
and at Camp Pinnacle. Who's ever been to Camp Pinnacle? Anybody? Any, yeah. A lot of good memories been up there. But because of the decline in giving, we've had to sell some, some of our retreat centers. And one of the most beautiful that we ever had, I thought, was the retreat center up in Tacoa. And, uh, and, and we had to sell that. And it's, it's now under a, a, you know, private ownership. But, but those are the things, just, 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 at a, at a, at a, just a snapshot. Then you go to the national because we send a dollar, 55 cents stays here, 45 cents goes to the national convention. What are some things that we are funding and able to be a part of? Well, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, Guidestone Financial Resources, the International Mission Board, Lifeway Christian Resources, the North American Mission Board, Gateway Seminary, which has five campuses, two in California, one in Arizona, one in Washington, and one in Colorado, and all of them are accredited. Just serving people desiring a seminary education out on the West Coast. You have Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri, New Orleans Seminary in New Orleans. Very good. You're awake. Southeastern Seminary up in Wake Forest, North Carolina, my alma mater. Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Southwestern Seminary in Texas. The Women's Missionary Union and all of its ministries is funded through gifts to the Southern Baptist Convention that come through the cooperative program. 13.2 million members, 47,000 churches. I'm going to give you one last statistic, and, and this to me is, I, I wish it was different. Of the 13.2 million members of Southern Baptist churches here in America, and we are the largest Protestant denomination. Catholics uh, have a much larger, but you know what the second largest is? The Black Baptist National Convention. They have 8 million members. But in the Southern Baptist Convention, the makeup of, of that 13 point, the racial makeup of that 13.2 million, 85% Caucasian, 85% white, 6% black, 3% Hispanic, and then the other 4% or so is, you know, several different 1% or 2 percenters. And so though we have built bridges and we have helped to start Black Baptist churches, and many of our uh, existing congregations have finally, uh, in the past 50 years or so, begun to embrace uh, members of the black community in whatever place where they have grown up, it's still not something that we see on a regular basis. Now, I'm not going to delve into the why of that. I think a lot of it's practical. You know, I talk to a lot of my, a lot of my black friends, Not I love them to death. They're so honest with me. And they'll say, I say, you know you welcome in our church. And they'll say, oh, I know that. Every time I go there, everybody's so friendly to me. I said, well, that, that you really are. You're welcome. And uh, I said, so why you know, and I say, PK, y'all music got to get a lot more black from going to be coming over there to that church. <laughs> and what they mean, what they mean by that is, is we just don't do music like so many of our, our sister black churches. We, we just don't. You know, our, our, it's, it's a cultural thing. It's not, not that one's better or one's worse. It's just part of that cultural thing. And, um, and, and so, you know, I don't, I don't know. When you get into a more metropolitan area, you'll see a lot more racial mixture in Southern Baptist churches. In more rural areas, you see less, less of it. Okay? But there's not a whole bunch anywhere. And when you listen to, that, to the statistics related to uh, ethnicity in our, in our groups... So, snapshot picture. I would say to you as your pastor, the Southern Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention is a great organization, spiritual organization to be associated with, doing good things all around the world. I haven't even gotten into the 10,000 missionaries that we support through cooperative program giving and through Annie Armstrong, through Lottie Moon, through state missions. Off. I mean, I haven't even gotten into all that. But none of, that would, none of that would be out there if way back there, even in the midst of all that uh, not, not good stuff that was a part of our beginning, 
if somewhere back in there there had, there had not been the voices of women like Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong saying, we got to do better. We got to do better. And we can do more, but we got to work together. We got to cooperate to reach this world. And Southern Baptists have been doing that. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I would say to you, you know what? Don't hang your head. Is, is Southern Baptist Convention, is our history unspotted? <laughs> no. No. Let me ask you, is yours? No. It's, it's, it's a bunch of humans that make up the Southern Baptist Convention. But theologically, doctrinally, missionally, and cooperatively, there is not a stronger denomination out there. And what a privilege it is. I consider it a privilege to not only serve a Southern Baptist Convention church, but to give money to that church, knowing that that money is reaching all the way around the world and back. And when somebody throws something up at you and says, I can't believe you, you say, you know, I understand why you're saying that, but that's not who we are. That's not who we are anymore. I was pastoring Blackburn Baptist Church. I know it's time to go. I was pastoring Blackburn Baptist Church. And we were starting to do some joint worship with a sister uh, black church here in the area. I was just trying to build bridges. And uh, so we had this grand idea. And I'm sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't at Blackburn. It was at Glenville, First Baptist Church, First African Baptist Church. Yeah, Kenny Murphy, he was, he was a deacon in that church. He was a good friend of mine. So we had this great plan. We we're going to have a joint worship service. First time we'd hold it at First Baptist Church. Second time we'd do it over at First African Baptist Church. Their pastor would preach at my church. I'd preach at their church. The funny part of that plan was, let's get our two choirs, your choir and our choir, and we're going to, Y'all practice this, this, this number right here, and we'll practice this number. And then the week before the joint service, we'll get together, put the choirs together, and have a joint practice. I, I was in our sanctuary the night they practiced. And uh, our choir leader thought it would really be cool to kind of, instead of having, you know, all the First Baptist singers like, together and all the uh, first African badges, you know, he, he mixed them in there so mixed. I cannot, I cannot over-exaggerate this. Because this is a song that had a little bit of rhythm to it. And I, I really am not exaggerating. In the best first Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention style, all of my choir members sing this energetic song and in between each one of our choir members there was a first A, B choir member I mean the body was just turning into liquid <laughs> eyes closed singing I mean singing it out and some of our bless their hearts some of them I <laughs> trying not to laugh out loud you can see them they were trying to concentrate they'd be like It was such a cultural difference in how we express music. And it's one one thing I love about my um, African-American friends. When I was in Haiti, you see the same thing. There is a bodily expression of worship that just like starts at the toes and it just, it just comes out, you know. In Southern Baptist, somebody cut that nerve in us, that worship <laughs> nerve, so that, you know, we're like this. Okay, and, and now I'm going to finish the story. I told you it's worth staying for an extra minute or two. The first AV choir, they came up with a plan for the service, which is the following Sunday night, no lie. They came in and they purposefully, instead of being, you know, First Baptist, First AB, First Baptist, First AB, they had all First Baptist on a row, and then directly behind, they had a First AB choir member. First Baptist, First AB, no lie. When the music started getting a little rhythm to it, whether it was the hymns, and especially on the choir anthem, this was their plan, and they did it. They'd be singing, and they'd have one hand on the shoulder of the First Baptist Church person in front of them. 
so slaying them. And it was such a great experience of worship. It really was. We, we, ha- we, have, we have learned to reach across the aisle. <laughs> we don't always do it well, but we do. Let's stand together and go. Goodness gracious. I, that was a great, great service. Father God, we bow before you to tell you that we love you. Father, we say that with our mouth. Oh, but we want to live that with our life. Father, we want our life to be an out loud shout of our love for you. In the way we deal with people, the way we react to people, in our, in our generosity, in our humility, in our service. Father, we, we want our life to scream that we are sons and daughters of the living God and that we follow in the footsteps of our big brother Jesus. Teach us how to do that consistently. Father, I thank you for how you have taken some people that started something in 1845 and didn't even start it for good reasons. But Father, in the hearts of those who are seeking you seriously, Father, you have grown something that is impacting the world. And I thank you for being a part of that. I thank you for these group of people here tonight and those in small group and those in choir and those um, in student ministry. I thank you uh, for Jake tonight as he stood in the waters of baptism out there at the pond at his grandmama's house uh, with his, with his uh, Sunday school class around him. I just thank you for all that we see you doing. We love you tonight. Get our hearts ready to worship together on Sunday. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There may have been a...